Army veteran, Rhodes Scholar, best-selling author, and also regular human being. Meet Craig Mullaney. These are your friends and neighbors. My friend Craig Mullaney's bio is sort of ridiculous. High school valedictorian, West Point graduate, Rhodes Scholar, Army Ranger, National Security Advisor, tech executive, best-selling author. You get it. I think of Craig, though, as just one of a handful of guys that I can really talk to about really vulnerable things, like trying to be a good dad or a solid husband, a decent friend, trying to balance ambition and imperative and meaning and purpose, trying to keep mindful of the long range and the near term. Craig is the only person who's ever had the temerity to meet me at four o'clock in the morning on a weekday on a pitch black street corner on the east side of Manhattan to drive an hour and a half into the mountains and what happens at the summit? Take it away, Craig. And we're live. When I talk about you, you're the only guy who had the temerity to meet me at 4.30 in the morning in the dead of winter, <laughs> haul an hour and a half north up the Hudson. What happened there? That was great. We climbed up Breakneck Ridge and we crested that last rock just as the sun came up and I think I pointed across the river and I was like, wait for it. And then the shot of the cannon from West Point. It is a lifetime memory for me. It was really cool. I was banging through your CV with my family. My wife and kids have heard about you, my friend, but they don't know your CV. And even my eight-year-old, I'm just banging through this stuff. And it's bananas. And I just want to say up front, we won't even try to cover all that stuff. What I'd like to do is to hit some points and bios and try and extract some sort of applicable lessons learned and get to the story, the wisdom that you shared so meaningfully in your letter to your colleagues called The Last Time I Was This Afraid. Yeah, that's cool. So I want to go back. Give me some color, please, on Warwick, Rhode Island. Born in Warwick, grew up in Wickford, um, neither town you've probably ever heard of. I had what in retrospect feels like a pretty idyllic mm. childhood. I was the oldest of four kids. Where we lived in Wickford felt pretty rural. Mm. And we had the run of the, of the woods. Behind our house were hundreds of acres of common lands. Probably my greatest memory of childhood is running around in those woods with mm -hmm. my siblings and my friends in the neighborhood. I developed a sense of independence yeah. and resourcefulness. Uh -huh. and, yeah, it's actually one of the things I struggle with as a parent mm -hmm. living in a world where kids are kept on really tight leashes. Yep. How do you give children that opportunity to make mistakes, grow, like take risk? Yep. What kind of household values were going around with the four kids? What kind of things were talked about in terms of an honorable life or a meaningful life or a life, if at all? Sort of like a wolf pack mm -hmm. uh, mentality within the family. Our closest loyalty was to each other. Your sibling is probably the longest friendship you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. Hard work. My parents were both blue collar workers. My mom was a nurse in the pediatric emergency room for Rhode Island Hospital. My dad was a utility worker at the gas company. They took pride in, in the overtime that they worked yep. you know, for our benefit. I never felt like we lacked for anything. Right. And now I know, looking back, how hard that was for them. Yeah. We were expected to contribute. I spent hours every week mowing the lawn, <laughs> literally chopping wood. My kids think I'm making it up. <laughs> we'll touch on the book, but for heaven's sakes, you're such a wonderful writer. I'm wondering what kind of arts were happening in the, in the house. Was there music playing? Were there books being passed about? Was that supported and encouraged? Reading. Yeah, definitely. We were all, we were all readers. Every morning I woke up, I saw my, my father with a newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, if we were ever bored or complained of boredom, the solution, if the weather was nice, was to be outside. And if it wasn't to, you know, find a book and take an adventure. Yeah. When you live in a small state and your horizon is constrained, books are the first class ticket to anywhere in the world yeah. in a time period. And I, I, lo I love that. I don't remember any other artistic huh. <laughs> inspiration and I wasn't a particularly good writer. Oh, is that right? In high school, college, my worst grades were in writing. Really? <laughs> I have a tendency 
to get frustrated when there is something I know I'm not doing well and then like really lean into it. I was afraid of heights. So I tried out for the skydiving team. That's great. So you're the valedictorian first. Do you remember the theme of your speech? I don't remember the theme of my speech, but I do remember that partway through my address, the electricity shut out in the cathedral. <laughs> Maybe it was a subtle hint that right. I was going on too long. <laughs> what would you share today with that young man? If you're whispering in his ear right before he walks on stage. It's good to take life seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn that until mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. Can I go to Oxford? I'm guessing there was a bit of a process of acclimating to that culture from prior cultures. My education at West Point had been highly structured. Uh, <laughs> the day was calibrated right, right. to the minute. Essentially, I arrive at Oxford and they're like, here's your library card and you know, you're going to turn it in a paper in two years. <laughs> right. I had no classes in my schedule. It took me about a month to find my thesis advisor. It was a totally open-ended educational challenge. I think what I discovered there is so much of the structure I had assumed was discipline at West Point wasn't the real definition of discipline, which is the ability to apply structure and sort of stick to structure while achieving your goals in an environment where no one is providing you mm -hmm. that schedule. And that's much more like real life. Yeah. Uh, like we don't go through life with a syllabus right. and quizzes and tests. Like you've got to sort of figure out not just the answers to the question, but the questions that you're interested in the first place. Yeah. So I want to skip to the Naval Academy. Here's the Army guy at the Naval Academy. And I remember going with my father to the Army-Navy game in Philly. I know that's a rivalry. And here you end up being like the highest rated professor, teaching these huge, huge classes, putting together what sounds like a, a massive project. How'd you close that gap? I'm a blue collar kid at a fancy prep school in Rhode Island. When I was a West Point cadet, I went and spent a semester at the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. I was an American studying in England. I was the odd man out in ranger school. I traveled around the world when I was at, at Oxford, very intentionally to get out of that mm -hmm. comfort zone. So by the time I got to Annapolis, I felt like I was pretty good at acclimating to a different culture without losing what was essential about my own. Mm -hmm. They played an awful practical joke on me. They, they assigned me to teach naval history my first semester. And I'm an army captain. Yeah. And my poor students, I was only about two lessons ahead of them at any given time. <laughs> Is there a lesson that you can recall teaching, maybe a you know, key takeaway in military history that you might think is applicable either to leadership or to managing uh, some of the uncertainty of our current day to day? History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You can't transpose directly the lessons from one episode in history, you know, to the current day, but you start to see patterns. History is so beneficial for military officers, those in the national security profession, and I would argue others because you have very limited opportunities to practice military maneuver. I mean, it's extraordinarily expensive to put on a big set piece, you know, battle, even to just have a platoon do a live fire ambush. Before going to Afghanistan, I could read, you know, 300 pages of the Russian experience in some of the same mountain passes. It's a very efficient way to learn and cost-effective way to learn. Let's go to Afghanistan together where you were in the 10th mountain unit. Did I get that correct, sir? 10th mountain unit, yep. You shared with your colleagues at Brunswick this really beautiful and profound and valuable, I thought, a uh, letter that you later were cool enough to share with you know, kind of the internets, as it were. And it was called The Last Time I Was This Afraid, which I love when you actually get to the article. It's actually the last time I felt this afraid and resolute. In the lead, you talk about your appreciation for your colleagues' vulnerability. It just really struck me because I don't think we think of, of warriors as leading with vulnerability. And I just wondered if you could unpack that word choice and your relationship with the in, sort of necessity to demonstrate that 
or is there a necessity to demonstrate in that some way or manner? Because I think you were in the letter. I think it's, it's generally impossible for the majority of human beings to pretend to be someone they're not. Mm -hmm. Real people get scared. Real people have doubts. You're unlikely to get a group of individuals to run up a hill to the sound of guns by beginning with a litany of all the things that could go wrong. Right. So this isn't to say that at every, at every crossroad, you need to signal your fears. I don't think of bravery and courage as the absence of fear. Right. I think of bravery and courage as driving through fear, recognizing what are rational fears and proceeding nonetheless, mm -hmm. because you have faith, you have confidence, and often because other people are counting on you. I want to be sure I get this right. The private in Afghanistan in your troop that was lost is Private O'Neill. Is that correct? Private First Class Evan O'Neill. Okay. Because you're a great writer in your book, The Unforgiving Minute. You've done a nice job painting a picture of what is a difficult moment. I've got to imagine that's right up on the top of the list of difficult moments for you as a leader, as a friend, as a human. What do you carry with that as like, okay, well, I got to honor that. PFC O'Neill grew up in a town similar to mine in Massachusetts, 19 years old, engaged to be married, mm. one of the best trained soldiers in our unit. That day he was shot in the opening salvo of an ambush right along the border with between Afghanistan and Pakistan. As he was bleeding, literally the last words out of his mouth were to ask if the rest of the team was okay. Mm. The moment I learned you know, over the radio that he'd been hit, it just sucked the wind out of me. Mm. And the muscle memory kicks in, and even under that emotional duress, you fall back on your training and what you've rehearsed. And we fought through the rest of the day. No one else was wounded or killed that day. It really shook my confidence as a platoon leader. What could I have done differently? Did I make the wrong call? Will I have the confidence of my men? Can I go back out there? And I think I continued to wrestle with that guilt and self-doubt and sadness for O'Neill for years. The writing of the book was cathartic exercise. It was making sense of this story for myself, putting what happened in my own words so that I could share with Evan's parents. And after having done so, being able to go see his grave, that was when I was able to forgive myself. I was of a mind at 25 in Afghanistan to believe if I'd studied the book and I'd done the drills and I did what I was supposed to do, everything would go right. No one would get hurt. And whether in a war or in life, that's just not the way it works. In war, the enemy has a vote. And, you know, in life, things happen. You want to be as prepared as possible. And, you know, that's your role as a leader of responsibility. But life's going to throw some curveballs, and you're going to strike out. You advised President Obama on military strategy. You know, keep me, keep me honest here. As he was campaigning, primarily during the 2008 campaign. What kernel would you share from your relationship with him? I think the misconception is of President Obama as being aloof. And in my experience, I found him to be fairly down to earth. The first time I met him when I was formally working on the campaign, I was like 10 days out of the army or something. I was waiting on the charter jet for him to board the airplane and reading through all my notes. And he boarded the airplane and... When a superior officer walks into a room in the army, you stand to attention. So I stood quickly in my seat, banged my head against the overhead, basically making a total fool of myself. And he just reached out his hand and was like, hi, I'm Barack. You must be Craig. You talk about pacing yourself in challenging times. How does that manifest in your experience? Ranger school or being in Afghanistan or training for a marathon, these are long endeavors. There's two traps you can fall into. One is the just one foot in front of another, 
mentality, which leads to mediocrity and ultimately frustration. You can't sort of see beyond the next step. You lose the bigger picture and the inspiration that comes from that. Mm -hmm. The other fallacy is to sort of just think about the end goal. Finish line. That ignores the real work and the slog and the discipline that goes into getting from point A to point Z. So the difficulty lies in the tension mm. of being present in the day to day and an appreciation and motivation from knowing where you're going to end up. Yeah, that balance. You talk about diffusing every fear with a plan. My uncle growing up observed that I could be an anxious kid from time to time, put a lot of pressure on myself and said, you know what I do, Craig, when I'm feeling worried or anxious, I sit down with a notepad and I make a list, mm. each of those things that I'm worried about. And then I go one by one and consider whether I can have any influence mm. over each of those items. If I do, you know, there's your to-do item is make a, how can you effectively influence this issue in your favor. If you don't, having the wisdom to place those worries, those fears, those anxieties with a higher power. I still will take that exercise from time to time of writing down, what am I afraid about? What am I anxious about? What am I worried about? And quickly parsing those things that I can control mm -hmm. or believe I can control in some way. Define please, Craig, snafu. The acronym SNAFU comes from World War II, situation normal, all effed up. One of many great acronyms to come from the military, FUBAR being the other. Right. Um, <laughs> at some point, you always had to have a SNAFU. There was a day when we were in the city of Gardez, the mission that I was given was to uh, help these army vets do an extensive veterinary clinic for all types of animals in Afghanistan that might come. We ended up with like thousands of livestock, sheep, camels, horses, cows, you name it, and all states of health coming over the horizon from every direction. We had to figure out what to do in that situation. And we ultimately learned how to disinfect cows and vaccinate goats and brand sheep uh, to know which ones have been vaccinated and smile while we were doing it. To me, this idea that when shit goes sideways, you must be relying on, and this is your point in all that training and rucksacking, practice, practice, practice. People say, you'll rise to the occasion. I totally disagree with that notion. Another wise ranger instructor, in this case, Gunny Oaks, told us, man, you fall to the level of your training. When it really matters, somebody's going to forget the batteries, lose the map. It's going to be raining and dark. Someone will be wounded and screaming. And your training is what is going to get you through that moment. And ranger school is an object lesson in muscle memory. You're average three hours of sleep at night. I was there for a hundred plus days. You're not all there mentally. So <laughs> it's being able to assemble and disassemble a weapon in a matter of seconds, if necessary, with your eyes closed or in the middle of the night. Yeah. We would do these drills, carrying each other hundreds of yards on this like grassy airstrip in preparation for what we call a mass casualty incident. You always plan and rehearse because while it might be a low probability event, it has high impact. Right. How are you advising leaders right now? Has your fear and resolution that you refer to in the letter, has that changed in the last few months? There's a lot that's similar about what we're going through, what employees are going through, companies are going through to being on a deployment in a foreign country. You don't necessarily know how long you're going to be there when the war is going to be over. You're spending a lot of time with a small group of people. A lot of days feel very much like the one before and the one after. There is this challenge to sort of clarify that vision of where the organization is going to be at various points in the journey, but keep in tension the reality of the day-to-day -day business that needs to be run. The transition I've welcomed with executives 
is a much more empathetic and vulnerable leadership style. Mm -hmm. They are more credible in bringing their teams along the journey when they acknowledge the difficulties that they face. It, it yeah. humanizes and personalizes them. One thing you have the benefit of when you're leading small unit leadership in the military, you look people in the eye day to day and you can't hide from your flaws because they're going to be obvious when you're on a 10 day field exercise. It's a lot harder in a world that is distributed and working remotely to establish that core connection. And right. so leaders have to work much, much harder at showing their own humanity and actively listening and learning from their team, from their customers. How would you advise folks just kind of saying, gosh, I don't know what's going to happen next, right? Social justice is upside down. I'm not sure what's happening in the election with the pandemic, with the economy, right? What do you do when you're in a trough? A bit of a surgical approach to enumerating what's in my control, mm -hmm. what's not in my right. control. For me, faith is a sort of a cornerstone of response in times of challenge where the instinct sometimes might be to go kind of down a solitary route, right. be conscious of the need for fellowship, even if you can't do it in real life, knowing that I can pick up the phone and talk with you anytime, the reach for friends and family to help pull you through when you're struggling and being okay with that. Yeah, It's not an acknowledgement that I'm not tough enough. I'm a human being and I need other human beings to get through the tough times. Right. And there's far more that's in your control than not. I'm sure no matter what party you're in, the election causes <laughs> angst. You can't escape it and it's stressful. If an outcome would make you feel less stressed, like you, you really want your candidate to win, what are the things you can do to make that outcome more likely? Yeah. Let me tell it is not reading another 10 articles. About <laughs> it's it. not doom scrolling, right? <laughs> Let's pivot. A little levity here, right? A little arts and culture. Who's your hero? Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Why? Knocked down again and again. Always got back up. Fascinating career in politics. A writer, an adventurer. Not a bad role model. Cared about the earth, yeah. Favorite quote? Go-to quote? Fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. What's your go-to place if you want to restore, revive? Anywhere in the forest. Mm. I actually track this on a spreadsheet to keep myself honest. Because if I go more than a couple of weeks without being on a trail run, on a hike, I just feel spiritually depleted. Yeah. Favorite song? A song that you love. I'm going to cheat. The, sort of the two songs my kids love me to sing to them at bedtime. The first is Hey Jude, and the second is American Pie. Good taste, these kids, and their dad. Would you read a tiny bit of Kipling's poem for us? So the, the last stanza, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, mm. and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Mm. When you think of that 60 seconds of distance run, what does that mean to you? If you're running a 400 meter dash, every single one of those steps mm. counts. And you don't want to cross the finish line with a doubt in your mind that you didn't leave it all on the field. Mm. That's a very meaningful poem and it's gave me the title of the book. Yeah. Craig. Thanks, man. Thanks for taking the time. I'm super grateful for your friendship because I grow a lot from this exchange. Cool. Thanks, Ben. The pandemic, Craig says, is like being on deployment. You don't know how long you're going to be there. It's an invisible enemy. You're spending a lot of time with a small group of people and a lot of days feel like the one before and the one after. And Craig advises leaders and the rest of us to be vulnerable, to bring others along on our journey by acknowledging the difficulties we all face, by sharing our humanity, the challenges and how we've navigated them or failed, sharing with one another. I'm a human being, 
Craig says. And I need human beings to get through the tough times. It's that simple. We need each other to get through the tough times. You know, Fred Rogers once said, there's something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with another person. What will you leave behind? Dawn breaks low and bright The day erase the night As far as we can see Tomorrow We fall and we fumble around The ruins of our town All shattered on the ground All the sorrow When the dream ends through And your black and blue Then you know that you've nothing left to do but find what's left behind. The dust clears to reveal the scars you once had healed and the bruises that you feel are still healing. When the dream ends through and you're black and blue and blind Then you know that you've nothing left to do but find What's left behind Dusk descends in gray, the night erases the day as far as we can see tomorrow. When the dream ends through and you're black and blue and blind, then you know that you nothing left to do but find. When the dream ends through, you black and blue and blind then you know that you've nothing left to do but find what's left behind 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 What's left behind? What's left behind?